Uh, we're a student-led organization, um, autonomous organization from the university, and um, we um, are really continuing a conversation that has been happening. Um, Idalia, who is one of our co-organizers, uh, pointed out how this conversation has been happening since 1492. Um, since the colonization of the Americas and since the colonization of many other um, spaces throughout the world. And so folks on the panel identify um, either as GLBTQ, um, differently abled, uh, working class, and or people of color. Um, and we think it's important to feature these voices because the university um, kind of has this uh, narrative that they, that they um, support diversity and uh, this institution has a mission directed towards diversity, uh, but we want to think about how they've contradicted that continuously, specifically because some of us were recruited to this university based on that diversity claim um, and have not lived that experience of having our experiences really um, valued here. So he specializes in uh, race, class, gender, um, Chicano and Latino history, culture and politics, immigration, and the U.S.-Mexico border, and Latino civil rights and the Chicano-Chicana movement, as well as African-American and Latino uh, relations. And he has a forthcoming book as well, um, entitled A Time for Resistance, the Chicano Struggle for Immigration Rights in San Diego Borderlands, um, from 1968 to 1980. So, welcome to... Inviting me into it, I think it's of critical significance that students, particularly students from historically marginalized communities, engage and participate in the processes of decision-making at the, at the university in order to infuse a democratic practice into the day-to-day -day functioning of the university, and as well to hold accountable the leaders and policies of this institution to its purported mission of benefiting society. Um, to create your own space, I think, of, of engagement outside of officially sanctioned events is something I support in order to develop an organic consciousness among students at, uh, about the issues at hand. And so I commend uh, this collective. So I think I'll, I'll throw out some questions and allow the panelists to, um, whoever you know, gets the spirit and wants to respond to the questions, we'll, we'll go around like that and hopefully develop a, a dialogue. Um, so I'll start out, uh, what is diversity, and what is your experience with diversity at the university? For me, unfortunately, I've come to learn what diversity is by what it is not. And here at the university, what it is not is this cosmetic diversity that the university likes to dress itself up in. And it likes to dress itself up in cosmetic diversity in an attempt to impress people. And usually it does this through maybe sprinkling like a few faces of color on university admissions catalog or on other forms of propaganda to solicit interest. Uh, to me, that's just an attempt to uh, dress up to impress and when you're using that form of cosmetic diversity, you have to question what is it you're trying to cover. To me, there's a big difference between cosmetic diversity and what I would call substantive diversity. Uh, and in this attempt to present people of color on various forms of propaganda. It's like this magic trick where abracadabra, poof, you have diversity because you see some people of color superficially on um, various forms of propaganda. I think in substantive diversity, it's different because it doesn't need to dress itself up to impress anyone. Substantive diversity is beautiful on its own. And uh, substantive diversity is about wrestling with and having candid conversations about existing hierarchies based on race, class, gender, and sexuality, and ability. Um, and until we can have those frank conversations, I think we're going to continue to entertain notions of cosmetic diversity and dress ourselves up in that same form. But in my opinion, real diversity, substantive diversity, doesn't need makeup. I kind of can piggyback off of what Rasan was talking about. Uh, my experience with diversity has been without it, actually. And I'm a sociology student, so that gets real tricky really quickly when you think about what I'm studying. I'm studying society and its functions and things like racial discrimination and education disparities, and who goes to prison, and who has money, and who doesn't. And somehow, my experience left at all of that. Somehow, 
when we're talking about social theory and we're talking about sociological function, we're quoting white European males who don't have any understanding of what a minority's experience is going to look like. But that's what I'm studying. That's what I've been studying for four years at this point. I graduated in the spring. So my diversity has been a lackluster formality, I guess. I get it on the, the things they send in the mail. My welcome week packet when I transferred my sophomore year was a beautiful, colorful, grandiose thing that I was like, oh, I'm going to get minorities. I know that there is you know, specific cultural centers place for us, which is, of course, what happens at a PWI. For those of you that don't know what PWI is, it's a predominantly white institution. Um, but when I got here, I got in my classes, and I was the only chocolate drop in there. And I got in my classes, and there was no black professors, no Chicano professors, no Latina professors, no Asian professors teaching me about minority experiences and what it means to be a social being, and what it means to be sociological. And I'm like, yo, you don't even know what it means to walk down the street and have to cross the street because they don't want to walk next to you. You can't tell me what it's like to be in this skin. So my diversity has not been an experience, it's been a lack of, it's been a wanting, it's been a wondering of where it's at. And I've even gone through my entire academic career here wondering where that diversity is and where that's going to come up, even in my curriculum. And it hasn't. Well, first of all, so thank you for inviting me. I feel <laughs> like, oh, I'm in with this panel of prestigious people to even be here is an honor. So thank you, and I'm just grateful that we actually have this space to speak about these things because a lot of times we don't have many spaces in underrepresented communities on this campus to freely express ourselves and talk about issues without um, people trying to um, invalidate our experiences. So for me, diversity at the University of Minnesota, I think that the University of Minnesota, as he was saying, is cosmetic, it's very caught up in the exception. They like to perpetuate the idea that, you know, that there's diversity by using the exception. We know, I was reading an article in the Huffington Post with black voices talking about um, the exception doesn't do anything to help systemic change. It just progresses the lie of racial progress or, you know, in terms of ability or sexuality or different things. So the, to me, the university definitely loves to claim us in terms to try to get people for admission or for whatever reasons they need for corporate interest. Everything is pretty much circulates around profit because the university, and the, the, that's what the president does, he raises money. Um, so, I think that it really shows up in the culture that is in the classroom. And for me as a student, when we come into the, that's, when we come to the classrooms and you see the way that you're treated, and not only by your professors or how, you know, it's kind of like you're guilty before you even enter the courtroom. So I think that there needs to be something done to not only produce some cultural competency or talk about more about why there is a lack of representation or what it is that's going on to help us kind of start those conversations and um, help just the people who are underrepresented and kind of, it's kind of like we're, it's like you're suffering. I was speaking to a gentleman the other day who told me that he had an anxiety attack because he was just so much under stress from this, you know, PWI and all the things that he was enduring. So. Thank you, Kevin. Um, if the panel doesn't mind, could I move to the next question? Maybe we can reference this, this larger question I think we'll continually come back to. Um, but the responses from the panelists, I think, have give us some concepts to think about diversity and how diversity is a contested kind of notion. Uh, we have this notion of cosmet cosmetic diversity versus substantive diversity, and we might continue thinking about what that means um, and how we could you know, what's the difference between those two kinds of concepts? Right now? And we also have this concept of no diversity. There still are spaces on campus where there are, there's no diversity. Um, and uh, students of color and um, queer students and other students find themselves isolated in these, in these spaces. And it's also layered, I think. It's not only the professor in the classroom that happens to be white or the students in the classroom that all happen to be white. It's actual theorists that we're reading sometimes, um, the authors. Um, so it's, it's, it's multi-layered, I think, and so we'll continue to kind of, kind of think about this. Um, and, and maybe we'll, we'll move to maybe a little more specific um, in some of the questioning. So um, thinking about the classroom uh, for a moment, um, do you feel um, that students like you are invisible in the classroom or hyper-visible 
in the classroom or in public or both at the same time? Um, how might folks think about that? Uh, I think for me, it's I experience personally experience both extremes. Like sometimes I feel you know very very invisible. Uh, reference to to me, my race. It's never it's made only in the context of you know that's the reason why you didn't really get that or that. You know, in, in, in negative light. It's, I'm sure you don't understand this because you might not be familiar with it. You know being a, a, an international student and then being a black international student, uh, being a, a lesbian student, a black student, adds a lot of dimensions on that. And so sometimes it feels really invisible. But then there are other times when I feel like I'm being you know, monitored to see if, you know, does she really have it together? Does she get it? Is she performing as well as the other students? I feel like everything that I do, every research, every presentation, is kind of judged in a more rigorous light. And I feel that part of that has to do with either being extremely hyper visible or the other extreme of not even being acknowledged. And so I think that it's a it's a really uh, it's a really big problem. And uh, I just I'm really happy that there's there's this forum where we can really talk about these things and bring it to light. My I came to Minnesota in 2007 as an undergrad, and I walked into a class of around. 250 students. I was at a Bell Auditorium. So I walk into this class, the African that I am, right? Um, and two things happen instantaneously. A, no one in this class looks like me. B, I'm coming with this ridiculous accent that I have. So the moment I open my mouth, people really quickly realize he's not American. So here's something else, right? So you experience this sort of double negation, A, as a non-white student, but B, not only are you not white, you're not American. So you, you're in this really strange place, right? And if you don't understand something, or if you challenge something, it's, well, you don't understand it because you're none of the above, right? And I kid you not, I went through my first semester, my first year here, Thinking diversity or diversity as a, as a concept was when you fill out your e, the end of semester evil forms, you have the race category, right? And that's what diversity meant to me, right? It wasn't something that I was a part of, right? It was something in which, institutionally speaking, I was an outsider because I didn't identify as African American or black, which, you know, it, I was African. And for me, I had always been African. So in this space where I'm acknowledged, but I'm acknowledged in the sense of not being acknowledged, right? And, and you exist, not because you are, but because you're not. And it's the, and, you know, and as a sociology undergrad student, you go through these things and you walk into these classes, now I'm a grad student, and you're a TA, you walk into class and people go, oh, you're not like the rest of everybody, right? And it's a, it's a really fascinating thing. So that that for me has been my experience. And you know, it, we talk, I talk to folks on, on in the department, and it's just, what do you do? You know, and how do you deal with it? So, yeah, that's been my experience. So this question is interesting because one of primarily my experience, even in like academia. So I started out the University of Pittsburgh. And where I come from, it's probably about 90, 98% African American in Gary, Indiana. So when I had the experience of going off to college, you have to go through that process of kind of like recognizing your identity as an other. So Pittsburgh, though, was relatively more diverse than what you encounter here um, in like, the Twin Cities. Pittsburgh is probably like 50% African American, 50% white, give or take or so. So coming here, and let me also talk about kind of like my discipline, because this is relevant too. So I'm in social work. And so my experience in social work in Pittsburgh was pretty diverse, where you have a lot of people of color who are looking to kind of go back, work in their communities, be organizers, um, or very interested in social justice. So I come to the Twin Cities, and it's very, the experience is very regional. And for me, being in the classroom, it was an experience of being kind of like hyper-visible where I'm the only person of color 
um, in, the, in, the, in the classroom. So, of course, you know, we're talking about social justice, race, poverty, privilege, and all that stuff. So, of course, like, you know, here's this little ghetto boy. So, he's the expert on that. So, when we get to these topics, everyone's kind of sitting in anticipation, waiting for my feedback, my perspective on it. And then when you speak, everyone's just, like, conveying this, like, expert status upon you. And this actually comes back to the first question around kind of like the experience of diversity. For me, diversity means kind of like varying um, perspectives and, and um, understandings of knowledge. And having like an opportunity to have interesting conversations with people from different contexts and different worldviews. But when you're in the classroom and you're the only person of color and others are kind of conveying this like experience of oppression and um, uh, uh, and being unprivileged uh, upon you, it makes it difficult to kind of like have like this discourse that you're hoping to grow from as a student. So a lot of times you'll speak, for me at least, you'll speak and then there'll be like kind of like no back and forth. And so mostly you're kind of there as a tool for, you're, you're a tool for education of the other students in the classroom. And so you're not really growing intellectually, you're not really having an opportunity to um, exchange dialogue to dig into complex, complicated issues for yourself, and so it becomes challenging. And so that's been an experience for me in my discipline, and in some other courses. I've taken a number of like sociology courses, and I've had like some more experience with people from different contexts and backgrounds, and so that's been a little bit more um, fruitful, but for the most part, it's been tough, kind of like just being that, that only person, chocolate drop, as you said, <laughs> in the classroom. So, it makes a difference, yeah. Okay. Um, so kind of, kind of going off of what my colleague had said, and I kind of referenced my major too, and I said, first off, coming from California, the Minnesota is a bit of a culture shock in itself. <laughs> Relatively, see, I'm passing that to cold Minnesota. Um, so I've noticed that um, through all the, all the classes I've taken in my child psych major, um, in terms of <clears throat> Diversity, um, cults of color, um, cults of different orientations, all that is uh, brief briefly mentioned. Um, there has been a lot of like studies done regarding our experiences in like, child development or anything like that. And if it is done, it's been briefly mentioned. It's usually a large study or just three points. Um, and also, as a <clears throat> an individual with a disability, I um, I mean, yeah, we have one class that focuses on disability and development and child sight, but that's not enough. It's too small. And then I also like, like um, disability services in general. Um, they tend to look more at uh, the disability uh, that students have, so it's more focused on, like, say, someone's visually impaired, and that's it. Or someone is deaf, and that's it. They don't notice, like, for myself, I'm visually impaired, and Latino but they focus on the disability. So, you know, we have all these, like, for example, I work with access assistants in my class of healthcare notes, but um, none, of them, none of them, like everyone else is said around here, none of them look like me at all. White, um, um, so uh, yes, no type of class, so it's, it's, it's a little different experience. And then, um, yeah, like I said, like disability services as a whole doesn't really focus, it focuses only on one aspect of our identity, not really. The entire aspect of our identity, so you know, notice in their eyes, I'm just uh, visually impaired. And um, I don't know, I just like to see it. You do a pretty great job, right? Like to see more uh, cultural, have these boys have like more cultural knowledge of others and not look at individuals like myself as just our disability. We, there's more to us than there's more to us than that. So. Um, and, and kind of uh, pulling off of uh, some of the comments, um, how do folks um, negotiate their own biographies in their scholarship or in the classroom? Um, on the one hand, you know, we as people of color are considered experts in our communities. Um, um, and on the other hand, those, you know, a lot of the broadest in the university are particular experiences in our community. Want to address or, or investigate or whatnot. So how do people how do people navigate that? I think for me, in terms of the work that I do, I'm a PhD candidate in feminist studies, and my dissertation focuses on um, Chicana and Chicano Latino.
working on helping our graduate students and their support systems and how they um, maintain connections to family, home, and community as a means to kind of survive in terms of the way that we are understanding our experiences. Um, and so for me, those biographies that Jimmy mentioned are so important to kind of keep intact. And that kind of, I found through my work, is not um, fully supported in terms of what the university wants from us when they're asking for diverse. And so this kind of goes back to what a lot of the panelists have already said. Um, it takes a lot. I feel like as a person of color, I've been in numerous classes where I have also been the only um, Chicana, the only person of color in my class. Um, and so that, I think it fluctuates from be, you know, feeling invisible, but also feeling very hypervisible and having to speak for your community. And I've actually had professors ask, you know, so what do Mexicans think about this? Or <laughs> is this true? Does this really happen in Mexican communities? And so there's a lot of pressure, and I think it gets to be draining to um, have to represent, but also sometimes wanting to represent to remind people that we are here, even if we're one. Um, or if we're 0.2% or whatever it is that the university um, you know, demographics are for 2014, I think they haven't, you know, they have a 2011 one out. Um, <laughs> but they haven't given us the new numbers. But I think wanting to represent and wanting to um, make sure that they don't forget that we are here and that our voices matter, that our families and our communities and our cultural support systems voices matter, um, it, it's a really difficult, I found it to be a very difficult Negotiate. So. And finally, thank you to Molly Lacey, who is a poet on the university, on our university's amazing USLAM team, a member of the Women's Student Activist Coalition Collective, and also a prince. Wow. <laughs> she is here to perform a piece for all of us to close out our event. From here, the stars look like their twinkling could be laughter. I swear they love one another. I swear they speak to one another. There are light years of cold black breath between them, drawn in breath after cold black breath, yearning for someone burning like us. Your heart beats its loudest when no one is in arm's reach. I want a poem for every girl with more fear than a friend. I want a poem for every girl who's tried to use a razor blade like a box of matches to see in the dark. I've cut my hands on my best friend's shoulders and watched her put herself back together alone. Years we've been told we were weak. Years we believed them. We are here. I want a poem for my ex-girlfriend starving to death in a hospital bed. Her eyes are twin black holes reaching for her body. I think God heals us with fire, not with water, and it's up to us to light it. I know a girl with a throat so full of gleaming white pain pills, she could have been a lighthouse, but the darkness still presses in. I want a poem for my sister who still believes every liar who says he loves her. Some days I wonder if I'm just trying to look like a boy so the real boys will leave me alone. I want a poem for me. I would wrap those words around myself like a mountain range. Wear them like armor. We are here. I want to scream that poem in the middle of church, etch it on every skyscraper. We are here. I'd fold it in my pocket and have believe it could stop a bullet. What the hell? Maybe it could. I want to hold that poem like a hammer. Build a place I could stare down the wind. Keep all my friends safe. Build somewhere to heal. Now we are here, maybe hundreds of miles apart, but still burning together. We deserve a place somewhere far away from bus stops with leering strangers, somewhere we can walk outside in the dark. I want us as close as we can get to the stars. I want to see them outstretched in my best friend's eyes. We are here. I want to hear them breathing as I fall asleep. I want the last words to be a heartbeat. Beat until morning. Beat on forever. We.